the new presentation. We'll add Alexander Kmosh. Kmosh. Correct me if I'm uh, I'm wrong. It's okay. The surname uh, is Kmoch. <laughs> okay. Alex is fine. Okay, Alex is fine. And uh, you will present the 30 maps in 30 days with Python. Yes. Great. Okay, the floor is yours. And uh, I remove myself. Okay. Right. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Saif. Um, yeah, I have the pleasure and the, the exciting possibility, opportunity to talk about the 30 day map challenge. And um, so that's why 30 maps in 30 days with Python. So I'm, I'm Alexander Kmoch. I'm a, currently I'm a research fellow at the Department of Geography at the University of Tartu in Estonia. You can see here in the background. Um, and actually, um, I do not have a long, long, very long experience with Python. I started really getting into it around three years ago when I also started teaching um, geospatial analysis with Python here in the university. So, so this is sort of my background. So I would like to um, introduce at first my um, sort of co-presenter, co-host, and the inventor of the 30-day map challenge, Topi Tukianov from Finland. Then how this whole challenge goes and the map themes, a little bit about the concepts and the stuff, how I you know, had to get by learning new stuff and putting uh, nice data on the map with uh, along those uh, map themes. And then I want to really share some, some lessons learned and some of the experience I came along doing that. So Topi uh, is a sort of GIS consultant slash um, instructor um, at Gisbo, Finland in um, Helsinki. And uh, he has basically sort of started the first first map challenge. Uh, and it was just in 2019. So he does a lot of uh, really cool map stuff with uh, QGIS. So he's uh, really also a proponent of, of open source and um, PhosphoG, uh, post, post GIS, etc. So, and the map challenge is on Twitter and Topi is also on Twitter, so follow him. And uh, it's, it's uh, always really a pleasure, all the things he's bringing up. So in 2019 was the first time, so this is now for last year's November, uh, the 30-day map challenge. So the idea is uh, he came up with like 30 themes for each day in November. And, you know, everybody who wants to participate, you know, creates a map and posts that map uh, on Twitter, ideally under the hashtag 30 day map challenge. And as you can see, it's, you know, really across the garden, points, lines, um, polygons, then, you know, geometric themes, then um, real world themes, environmental, and so on and so on. So it's it's actually really, really interesting to see what's what's going on on Twitter during November, to, to see all these amazing, beautiful maps. And people use all sorts of, um, tools and and uh, of course also <laughs> esri you know arcgis but also lots of qgis you see a lot of r stats are people doing uh, maps with r and um my take on it was of course uh, sort of also from the educational perspective to do it uh, with python so and actually this thing become became so popular and that somebody even made an inventory and uh, the URL is, is posted here. I can share the slides later. And uh, so in 2019, in the first year, so when, when he did the Twitter analytics, it's of course no, no exact um, science, right? But around 600 people were tweeting on the hashtags. They created around 3,500 maps. And um, 25 people actually only created all 30 maps. And uh, last year, 2020, it basically doubled. Um, so it's um, 2,400 uh, 1, 1, people made um, interacted on Twitter, made around 7,000 maps, and uh, 67 people apparently managed to create all 30 maps. So that is still, remember, it's one day, 
one map. Next day, next map. So um, as my take was to do it with Python, um, I really need to give a big shout out to the whole Python um, uh, environment ecosystem really in particular here pivis has really listed that was really a super valuable resource and here we down here we have also of course the geospatial world that there's even more things you know like um, data shader and other things that are not even um, <laughs> listed here directly under under geospatial so have a look on this website pivis.org if you if you haven't been there it's it's amazing so, th so much for, for the resource. So, um, as I, I am a little bit of an educator here also, um, I'm, not, I'm not a crazy good, you know, coder or anything, but my idea was really to also document my experiences to show, um, you know, how I solved the challenges and, and sort of what I also learned along the way. So, I created this GitHub repository um, with the with the web page, of course, made in, in Sphinx, of course, and I share also the notebooks or the Jupyter notebooks um, for each day where I participated. So in order also to make it reproducible, so I'm not going to show code now. I'd rather show, um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the map challenge itself and show some nice maps. And um, you guys can uh, explore uh, the notebooks. So and admittedly, um, it is really, really hard, actually, even even if you're a seasoned um, geographer or a GIS person, and even if you're really good with your tools, like um, it is still one map a day for 30 days in a row. So the first thing is, of course, to come up with a nice idea to to actually visualize, you know, something to the theme. Then the next thing is, of course, you want to find data and ideally open data. So uh, so you can actually, you know, share it with the world. Um, so getting open data is becoming much easier nowadays. The next step is you have to churn the data somehow into a nice map, really. And for that, you have to do some processing, obviously, and then you have to do the styling. So you need the idea, you need to find data for it, and you need to have good enough skills to really do a great map. And styling options, I really put it here like this because it's really, you know, from, from arcane plotting options in Matplotlib and, and how to use uh, other toolkits like, like data shader or, or GeoViews. It's at first, of course, are there options existing to support the way you want to plot it? Do you know these, you know, can you even use them? And then, of course, how, how good and how effective you are and actually doing this whole thing um, and producing a nice map. And then the next day comes, and of course, you have to do it again. So in terms of concept, um, it is really quite curious. Um, uh, you have to think, of course, about data acquisition. Then you have to do the pre-processing. And I took a little bit you know, demand on myself that I tried to also do a bit of a spatial analysis. So because this sometimes produces nicer maps because you actually show maybe a spatial relationship. So it's really sort of sort of challenging yourself also. And of course, over time, um, you want to improve the plotting and the styling. So, so I learned I learned a lot and I, but I was not um, uh, super confident, of course, in, in doing all these things. But um, yeah, it's a lot of practice. And I think the practical learning learning these and practicing these along the way uh, of this challenge was, was really exciting. So a little bit uh, <laughs> sort of minimalistic statistics of um, how, how I went about. Of course, most of the time, particularly if you work with uh, vector data, I uh, used the GeoPandas and the GeoPandas plot function, and which basically is using Matplotlib. So a, a big shout out, of course, to Matplotlib that supports so like the the complete uh, most of the plotting really that that I've done sort of under the hood really, and then there's a couple of other really really interesting toolkits like uh, GeoPlot, which uh, provides um, functions to do interesting um, visualizations, so-called cartograms and uh, kernel density plots. So it's really meant as a visualization. Then GeoViews, 
which uh, then also uses uh, still car to pie things under the hood for uh, global global um, maps. So that that is and GeoViews makes it so much easier to to um, you know plot um, uh, ve vector um, vector layers. But it, it needed for me because I was working so much with the GeoPandas and and Matplotlib. It was really a slightly Different approach um, how to how to use the geo views semantics and and creating maps, and then some other interesting things. EarthPy uh, is is um, super cool. Uh, has some functions uh, also to to plot bands for for satellite imagery. Really um, sort of convenience functions, and you can create hill shades. So that is, that is really cool in, in EarthPy, and then some other things I used is. Um, Python um, to sort of raw image um, uh, functions to create, for example, GIFs and, and those things. And I said data shader, and also I also made at least one map in Folium, which is a Python library to create leaflet maps. So, and and there's there's probably no surprise here in, in working with data for the in initial churning, et cetera, GeoPandas, Rust.io, and GDAL. Contextually is really nice, or contextile, actually, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, to get base maps. Um, I also use requests, and I don't know why I re use those two um, separate ones, actually, to, to, to load um, either raw data from open data repositories or um, to, to um, query services to get, um, for example, image data. So. And then OWSLib is, is a great library. If you haven't heard of it, um, it is a very, very low dependency, almost no dependencies um, Python library that um, supports a lot of the Open Geospatial Consortium standards. So and I used it uh, in, in this case uh, to, to query WMS services to, to get basically you know, a bunch of WMS images um, for, for certain bounding boxes. And also really cool uh, new experience for me, um, OpenStreetMap, uh, OSM NX, you can query OpenStreetMap API for, for spatial data and you can sort of directly convert it into your GeoPython library type of your choice, which is usually Shapely, GeoPandas, DataFrame. And um, then sort of regarding spatial analysis. So I did some experiments. As I said, I took the challenge a little bit to, to try lots of different things. Um, just loading you know, a file, a data file, and just making a map is possibly easy, but then maybe also a little bit boring. So I used, of course, GeoPandas and Shapely uh, based on it for clipping, joining, intersecting, all these other subselecting from PySAR. PySAR is a fantastic project. For, for spatial analysis, but in this case, I only used uh, the map classify in most cases um, for reclassification. As I said, GeoPlot has great um, additional visualization functions like kernel density and, and cartograms, including others, uh, EarthPy Hillshade. And then I worked a little bit with uh, digit, uh, discrete global grid systems. So if you've heard of, uh, I just in the, in the previous talks also, Uber H3, for example, is sort of um, is something and in, in where we have a grid of evenly spaced um, cells sort of covering the whole globe, and um, so there's there's more of those DGGS systems, and I tried a couple of those um, pie shades. So if you are into um, hydrology with pie shades, you can do um, watershed discretization, watershed um, and, and, and catchment delineation. Then I did some interpolation, inverse distance with nearest neighbor, some, some nice script based on, on SciPy. And uh, also a trend, um, trend calculation, sort of, you know, sort of to add some, some interesting uh, stuff on top of the raw data, really. And this is <laughs> a, 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 a a humble diagram, a uh, histogram showing um, how many layers I, I used um, in order to produce those maps. So, and you see that the high counts 
is for for either one, two, three, and five layers. And there's one one map where I had to take like seven layers, and um, but it's more usually just a very few number of layers. But rather present those, don't overload the map. They were sort of one of those um, sort of cartographic, stylistic um, uh, intentions, sort of. So and then I would like just to show some some maps. So I'm I'm going through not all of them, and. Um, just to show examples and maybe give a, a couple of comments here and there, uh, what was interesting or, or complicated or new about them. But of course, we start with classic, classic simple maps. That is just um, Estonia and from the Estonian State Forest Management, public recreation sites with a legend, you know. So, but the map by itself here is not as crazy interesting. But of course, if you want to do basic data visualization, um, as each of those maps and also the other maps that I made has a notebook related to it, there's always a couple of interesting little things you know, that you can probably learn and skill up um, in order to make your maps a little bit nicer. Then, uh, of course, also classic GIS land use maps, and uh, this uses a nice hexagon scheme. And admittedly, building that legend, uh, that was a bit of a pain because uh, although the Copernicus uh, land cover data set provides the legend, not all legend types are present uh, in Estonia. So I had to somehow filter that out. So that is a bit of a, <laughs> you know, one of those uh, pre-processing uh, hacking things that take a lot of your time away every day. And then you have to find a nice color scheme, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and then one of the things that I got really into, I found really exciting, is plotting globes with geo views. That is that is just um, beautiful. You can um, also center, as you see, the globe is uh, sort of <laughs> egoistic, like like we are centered on Estonia, um, just for this example, and it's just a natural Earth data set um, colored with the population and some classification scheme. Uh, should of course had a legend, um, but at some point you know you have to spend so much time, and you think like, oh, I finally got the map plot, uh, you know, plotted, and then comes you know your cartographer next to us like, hey, you need a you know proper legend and title, and and then sometimes I just fail with it because that's you know that's so much work, but you have to of course um, also be proud that you you make some nice plots and. Um, always improve improve your skills so another another um, globe again so this is the population density gridded in um, uh, so-called ICA uh, um, uh, h7 DGGS hexagon so there's a library called DGG grid and um, some of you might or might not have heard there's also an R implementation, uh, DDG grid for R. I, I wrote a little script that, that would run DDG grid within a Python environment, and you would then generate your geometries directly for GeoPandas as a geodata frame. And um, and then I plotted it again uh, against um, with, with GeoViews. And it takes the the NASA grid population and uh, with uh, raster stats, for example, you would uh, do the the nah, the uh, summary aggregation of, of the raster of the underlying raster, which is a, probably a big geotiff, and then into the hex cells and yeah, so that there's some some really interesting stuff going on. And as I said, look at the, the notebooks are available, and for Last big globe and then grids type of um, the hype nowadays with hexagons. So this is a comparison of different hexagon and, and other grid cell based systems. Again, DGGS systems. So in the upper left corner, you have um, the ICR um, Aperture 4 hexagons. Um, and on the upper right, it's uh, Uber level one, level two uh, hexagons. So Uber has an aperture seven hexagon. You see there's seven smaller hexagons within one bigger hexagon. And then another really interesting DGG grid system, which is 
who would now <laughs> really nicely implement it also in Python as a Python library on PyPy, for example, is our heel picks from Landcare New Zealand. And then also on the lower right, there's a, a grid system based on, on triangles. So those grid systems, as you see, they're always about uh, tessellation of cells that cover the globe, uh, the globe evenly and that um, are having some parent-child relationships in a way that you have this aperture, how much of the smaller elements make up the bigger elements or how to the subdivision. Interestingly, for those grid systems, it is also that um, they have even uh, uh, different different um, properties. For example, Uber, Uber is optimized for the distance between the cell centers is um, optimized. So this is the smallest error, whereas or, or deviation, whereas in um, the real peaks in land care and also this ICR aperture 4 of DG grid, for example, they have optimized for equal area property. Yeah? So not all, not all grid systems that cover the earth evenly are sort of um, the same, clearly. So then, of course, let's go somewhere towards um, elevation and, and some, some nice mapping. So this is actually, actually the uh, DEM that you can download from NASA. It's the DEM of Mars. So it's actually not Earth. So it's funny that I plotted with Earth Pi. <laughs> Little pun here. And um, so we use Earth Pi to create the hill shade and then plot uh, also a color scale on top. And of course, in red, because it's the red planet and the theme was red. But um, and of course, the coded reference system um, was complaining that it was not, it's not the celestial body was unknown. That, the <laughs> that, that was interesting. Then, of course, can plot elevation also with proper classic uh, uh, scientific surface plots. And um, as I said, stream delineation. So this is completely done in Python, which is really, really cool based on the DEM. And your poor point, you can directly delineate um, streams within Python. So that, that, is, that is great. And here, another scientific sort of water-related topic. So these are rivers and streams in Estonia, and the points um, is a bit small here right now, uh, are measurement stations, hydrological measurement stations for steam flow. And we did um, with Pi man candle. So the man candle trend can give you, uh, analysis can give you a trend of, of increasing or decreasing of a time series. So when we looked at, um, at that for, for Estonia, and you can download the data from the Estonian Environmental Agency, uh, from now from the weather weather service, and so the notebook downloads the the CSVs, parses this in, into the data frame, um, does the datum conversion, the date conversion, takes the last 20 years, and then um, gives you a trend or no trend or significance, uh, you know, this uh, p value 0 0.05. And then we put it on a on, on a on a map. So there's you know there's science and map making together really the spatial analysis. So that was a really good exercise. Um, another interesting exercise is um, you can download this data from also from from NASA or from one of those um, labs. So the links are in the, in the notebook, and you can download them as TIFFs. And uh, what I did, I clipped them all together and made, uh, plotted them into GIFs, GIFs, GIFs. <laughs> and uh, with Pillow, uh, Python Pillow, you can make a nice GIF as a, um, as a time series. So the blue is actually the ice concentration. The central white is, of course, Antarctica. And this is, of course, from November 2020, so from last year when the map channel was on. Um, so that, that is an interesting visualization. If you would now take more time, I didn't take more time, like uh, take it over 10, 20 years, of course, the processing would take a bit longer, but then you would actually be able to see a really interesting long, the, the long-term trends. And uh, talking about islands and um, historical data, so we have an island here in Estonia, it's called Vormsi. And uh, the land board of Estonia has a lot of old maps digitized. So I used OWSF, uh, OWSLib 
to query the bounding box of this island for all these 20 different layers of, of old historical maps. And some of them are actually um, time-wise sort of sorted. So you can sort of see uh, sort of the evolution of map, map making for, for Estonia. So I found that, that quite interesting. And then some uh, more artistic things. So geoplot, as I said, you can do some nice um, plots uh, for visualization. Here's a KDE plot of a blue cornflower, which is also Estonia's national symbol. Then um, cartograms. So cartograms are really cool. You can have uh, the scale of the of the map element also related to the data. So you don't only do a choropleth map, but you also um, change the shape, the scale of the element in order to represent the magnitude of a thing. So and the theme was big, small data. So we used um, place names for big and small um, in Estonian is in the name and uh, represented both. So the red ones are um, where the place name contains the word big or great and the blue ones for small. And you see interesting spatial patterns here that uh, overall there's less red um, and there's slightly different uh, areas where blue is more dominant. And this is a really interesting um, cartogram, which I stole from Evelyn, uh, Evelyn Urma, also on Twitter, um, Evelyn Urma, who is uh, one of those very few people who actually managed to do the, all the 30 maps. And um, so this is actually the bounding boxes. She did it in QGIS, I, I stole the idea. Um, so this, the idea is the, the bounding boxes of the countries are just plotted as a, um, as a, a bounding box in, in Robinson. I think it is Robinson or Mollweide here. So that, that is more like of an artistic um, thing. And then um, this is actually not, <laughs> this is not a mistake. So I'm uh, actually not, I have actually not done all the 30 maps because um, particular challenging a map with a new tool and a non-geographic map. And I wanted to do it in Python. So um, I didn't really get an idea. And I also took the time to rest. And towards the end of the challenge, I got really, really, really tired. And then uh, some, some uh, more artistic jokes. Of course, Null Island. Um, uh, maybe a geographer you know, understand, you know, this is where the Nile Meridian and the Equator cross. And of course, no data. There's no island. Um, and uh, data data shader is a, is a really interesting tool that it took me some time really to get uh, to grips with it. Um, it's sort of not immediately intuitive if you have worked 20 days before with something else. So this is uh, again the river network and with some some overplotting to give this shiny effect sort of. And um, this is uh, mobility. So this is people moving between different uh, settlements and and uh, cities within Estonia. As, as lines, so that is um, sort of a bit fancy um, to, to, to really get to work with uh, this. And this is another interesting um, styling that uh, we used um, OSM, OpenStreetMap data extracted the, the building footprint. And you just, you know, you just do a buffer about the center and then you clip it out. It's, it's literally just purely, purely Python um, cut and, and styled a matplotlib, normal, normal GeoPandas plot, actually, but using the, the data from OpenStreetMap as a building footprint. And the last one here, um, <laughs> there was another theme, make a map that's not done with GS software. I, I couldn't resist it. I took one of those globes and I, I, I transferred it into, into ASCII art. Also, there's also a little script behind it that does that, does that, that shading with the letters, so that is, that is, uh, yeah, that, that was that. So as a conclusion, it was, it was awesome. The, the vibes during these, you know, you talk with your, your colleagues and then you see all the activity on Twitter is, is really, is really exciting. It is slightly insane. You spend at least one or two hours each evening for a whole month. So, you know, other things are suffering a little bit, but I, I must admit, I, I learned so much and it was, um, it was really helpful also for my courses. I point my students to it. Um, you know, for, for inspiration and to skill up. And of course, I will do it again ne next year or this year, actually. Thanks. Thanks a lot for, for uh, your interest. That's me.
Thank you, Alex, for your presentation. I can see it's a, it's a, good, it's a good competition. Well, we have some questions. Uh, it's about daily map themes. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, yes, so the last two years, um, Topi actually announced uh, them a month before. So uh, you have like, like uh, begin of October latest. And then now this year and, and next year, they um, he sort of also engaged with the community and asked, hey, you know, what do you think? And uh, because everybody knows that it's so much work, um, maybe, you know, do some things that are, you know, that don't take so much thinking and so much data crunching maybe. And, um, but yeah, they're known, uh, they will be published a, a month, a month before. Great. Yeah. This one is about the um, availability of um, data. Um, nice presentation. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Um, that, is, that is a very good question. Um, some of the mobility data is publicly accessible, and then some is um, uh, collected or collated or collected um, by by researchers in, in our department. But then the, the 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 they have sort of ground through it and it's anonymized, and then it's only the numbers. But I think. I think this mobility data might might actually be accessible. But then the, the thing is, I'm here in the department. I only see what the, they sort of. Uh, I'm a little bit in the bubble here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Toppy was also, I think, just writing. Um, I think yeah, we we can also credit the the R community a little bit. They they are also very very active. I think I mentioned that at the beginning, and but of course, it's the GeoPython conference. <laughs> And QGS, really active. <laughs> yeah, and Q QGS um, is also, I mean, it's all, uh, it's Python open source. So, you know, we can also credit QGS to, to Python. But I actually did it in Python coding. I think this question was already, wasn't it? Not yet. So, uh, The more we are written. Okay, great. Everyone is saying like <laughs> great presentation. Thank I will, you. Good I will go in the chat and I put put the slides. Um, oh, this is a nice question there. Um, Any books that you recommend? I, I, actually, I wanted to to check books, but um, I think actually I didn't. I, I just went to through through the online. I think the hardest to learn was from from the uh, GeoPython and um, uh, Geo GeoViews and then Data Shader because this is sort of the the intuition is is a bit uh, different. So, uh, but they are, they have great examples on the website again, and I'm just going also through all their their um, demo notebooks. That that's rather. Someone is answers. asking. <laughs> great. Sorry, uh, it's asking about the package combination. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So for for plotting globes, like you saw, like in the beginning, that one of those globes, the globes geo views is really cool because um, you just give it the, the the data frame and you say, you know, like autographic projection, for example, and you can send that. It's just one line of code, and you can take those 
those uh, oceans and, and land masses that, that comes as, as, as a one liner. So that, that's fantastic. Um, Geopandas is, is the bread and butter, seriously. Um, <laughs> that, that is, that is amazing. I, I can't, I mean, like every day I, I do, I, I load a shapefile, bam, or a geo package and I look through, I mean, pandas, geo pandas, um, Rasta IO really quickly, EarthPy for, for Rasta plotting even, even more, more uh, convenient. Yeah. I can't, I think I can't really focus on one because, uh, um, it's difficult when you are working with something. It's, uh, I think all of them. <laughs> yeah, of them. exactly. Because this, this, the geo plot, for example, with these kernel density and those cartograms, I, I guess it really depends also what you want to show, really. Yeah, exactly. Open source data, or did you just. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of really good. Um, really good um, data portal. So as I'm, I'm also I'm a little bit into the spatial data infrastructure stuff. And um, so there's lots of really good open data portals, but there are many portals. So <laughs> you always have to look through. But then there's Google data search, Google data set search. And then there is um, geoportal.org, which, which is like a broker of like almost like all the European geo portals and whatnot. Um, and then each country has probably their own open data portal, like, you know, um, data gov, you know, in the US, in Estonia, we have one. Um, the EU has now also EU open data repository. So Zenodo, yeah, it's, it's rather there's too much and you rather have to, that, that's one of those challenges. There's so much stuff and you would how to, how to zone in that you get something done today, you know? Uh, GeoViews allows for global. So there's actually GeoViews is, is um, sort of really a high level based on sort of uh, holo views. It's called and as as plotting backends, you have to show you can choose Matplotlib or Bokeh. And if you use Bokeh, then you can I think also pan the zoom because Bokeh is does this interactive or Bok Bokeh, however it's pronounced. <laughs> yeah. But they they have slightly different um, semantics again, so that that is some 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 tricky. Yeah, but I think you, as I wanted to make this for the web here and in making static maps, I uh, put them uh, as as all matplotlib. So yeah, I think time is up now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Time is it's, uh, obvious. Gaps. It's oh, over. That's, that's a good, this is the best last question. Um, I think not necessary a new library. And I see over the last one or two years, really, the, how the ecosystem is developing. And I think for, let's say, for my needs and for making all these different maps, it's, I think it's just the maturity and interoperability between those libraries, because many of them depend on each other. You know, of course, always GDAL um, under the hood, um, you always you know that all this install is smooth and i think this is if this stays how it's you know the the convergence is fantastic i think you don't need many new libraries yeah some some maturing of the existing libraries and as long as it's interoperable then there's some edge case of course like this global grid system stuff then of course you, there's the next uber h3 or whatnot so Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for all the questions. I know it's really exciting. And Toby is, is very active on the chat as well. He's, uh, he's, he's also or... very active on Twitter. Yeah, he's, he's ah, a great guy. He's also really great. an outreach guy. <laughs> great. I think uh, time is over now. Time's up.